Hi, I'm Kelly Cervantes, and this is Seizing Life, a bi-weekly podcast produced by Cure Epilepsy. Today on Seizing Life, I'm happy to welcome Mike Coburn, the Executive Vice President and Chief Operating Officer of Research America. Founded in 1989, Research America advocates for science, discovery, and innovation to achieve better health for all. The organization urges policymakers to increase funding for the NIH, CDC, FDA, and others at levels that keep pace with scientific opportunity. With the COVID-19 pandemic disrupting life across this country, Mike is here to discuss the pandemic's effect on the scientific community and how it might impact epilepsy research and the epilepsy community at large for years to come. Mike, thank you so much for joining us today on this incredibly important uh, and timely topic. We have all been, our lives have been drastically affected by COVID-19, the understatement of 2020, I suppose. But what I really want to dive into today is how COVID-19 has really impacted our research partners and what that means for them when their lab is shut down, what, um, how that affects the researchers and the research that, that they're doing. I know that's a very broad question to start with and, and we'll dig in a little bit more as we go along, but what has the, the overarching impact been for the research community? Well, well, Kelly, it's a pleasure to be with you. And uh, I'll have to say that, you know, the pandemic has caused an abrupt stall in research, research on every level. You know, as you know, uh, most of of, um, government funded or NIH funded research takes place at universities. And the universities and other employers have had to adhere to, you know, um, the protocol to keep their employees, their staff safe. And so labs have closed. Uh, they closed pretty abruptly in, in March, and uh, labs, depending on where they're located, are, are still at a level of partial operation, full shutdown, uh, and some may be up and running you know, more fully. Again, uh, you know, local um, mandates dictate how well institutions can you know, rebuild their, their normalcy, and uh, so you know, it, it has stalled research. And the, the problem here is that research isn't a start and stop activity. It, it's a continuum of, of discovery. And so all of the work that had been done up until March, March 12th or 13th or whatever the day was in March, when we were all hugely impacted, that, that knowledge is, is left on the bench and, and not perhaps picked up. You know, there's, there's lost opportunity. Uh, you know, you look at the researchers themselves and they've had to leave, you know, the environment in which they work in and thrive in, which is, the, you know, the bench side, and, 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 you know, have been working at home. And you can't do, you know, basic science at home. There's been a lot of writing, a lot of research, and they've used, you know, their time um, optimally to, you know, wrap things up that they hadn't been able to do and to plan new research. But they're not back at it yet, and, and, and it will take some time. So what happens to the research that they were doing in the lab? Do, you know, what happens to the animal models that they have been working on? Yeah, that, that, you know, that's unfortunate. There, there, there were emergency um, policies that were put in place by many institutions to preserve animal models. Um, and so there was an attempt, and, and NIH has you know, said this as well, to um, provide that emergency you know, kind of status for certain employees to keep the models going, but there was no further research. It's a matter of trying to preserve, you know, the knockout mice, the rats, or, or whatever the model might be. Um, and there was the, the unfortunate, um, you know, need to, you know, stop experiments. So they weren't being used in, 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 in you know, actual experiments. They were just keeping the colonies, you know, um, alive um, for future, you know, Abuse. And and how were researchers' salaries affected? Do they still get paid even though they're not doing research? 
Yeah, you know, that's a good question. And, and fortunately, NIH, by the way, has been extraordinarily flexible. And most of, of the university level research is funded by NIH. They've been extraordinarily flexible in terms of working with, with their, their grantees. Um, salaries are continuing to be paid for by the grants. Scientists continue to work, you know, hard in, in terms of writing up a lot of research. There's been uh, just a, an abundance of new publications, almost a flood of new publications that have come out during this past six months because scientists have shifted from hands-on experiments to data analysis and, and, and writing up their research. So on that end, you know, there's been great productivity. Their salaries have been able to be continued uh, uh, under the grants. However, um, because their salaries have been able to be continued and their activity has been diverted to other you know, non-lab activity, if you will, a non-experiment activity, there's probably, an, uh, you know, a challenge that, that money could run out down the road. In other words, they've got to get back, restart research, restart their experiments, but, you know, the grant has been using money all along, and they may run to the end of the road. And so important there, Kelly, is the, the need for Congress and this administration to pass in the stimulus bill a robust uh, a mark for funding, NIH funding, to restart research. We as a, an advocacy organization are asking Congress and we're asking all of our advocates, anybody we know, to, to ask Congress to include at least $26 billion in this stimulus bill to restart research so that those salaries for, for the scientists who have been working can be picked up and continued. As we are recording this particular episode, uh, it's probably worth noting that it is a week before uh, the presidential election. And I do believe that Congress has just uh, gone on a bit of a break, or uh, the Senate has at, at the very least. So um, are we hopeful that something like that will be passed, that, um, you know, that researchers will get that stimulus money that they so desperately need? And, and what is at risk if they don't? Yeah, well, you know, again, as you say, when, when this um, episode is aired, we'll be on the other side of whatever happens on November 3rd. And I think that there's great um, interest, in, in, in certainly in the House, to, to pass a bill and to include stimulus for NIH. Um, the Senate has been, you know, when it's not caught up in the political realm that it is right now, has been very supportive of NIH. And the House and the Senate have come together in the past, and we hope that's what will happen past the election. Um, there is, you know, um, optimism that uh, that Congress will include, you know, uh, robust stimulus for NIH. The, the level we don't know yet, but you know, Dr. Collins, the director of NIH, has has given the scale that you know we we need to see, you know, uh, about 26 million billion or, or more to restart research. Um, so it's been, you know, caught up in the politics, and it's so very unfortunate because it's 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 nail biting. You know, PIs are looking at how do I keep my lab running. Uh, early career researchers are worried about their careers. And these are all impacts, of, you know, it's the impact of what we're going through with the pandemic and the need to, you know, follow public health directives of staying apart and, uh, you know, working where you're in your kitchen, I'm in my downstairs room. <laughs> Hi, this is Brandon from Cure Epilepsy. An estimated 3.4 million Americans and 65 million people worldwide currently live with epilepsy. For more than 20 years, Cure Epilepsy has funded cutting-edge, patient-focused research. Learn what you can do to support epilepsy research by going to cureepilepsy.org. Now back to Seizing Life. You bring up something that is is sort of terrifying, this idea of, of young researchers. And that's, you know, something that Cure Epilepsy has been very involved in, in trying to um, certainly get young researchers into the field of epilepsy research with our Taking Flight Award. Is there sort of discouragement among, um, you know, students who had planned to go into research and are now looking in other directions because the landscape is so uncertain? You know, we've heard, you know, um, stories of this, and certainly there's been, you know, all along the, the lack of, of, of people wanting to go into STEM 
for various reasons. And, and so when they see what's happening right now with the uncertainty in the academic institutions and, you know, young scientists who are, you know, postdocs or, or just early in their career are not sure where the funding's coming from, there's, there's a great deal of anxiety. Um, and I think that part of this stimulus funding for NIH, uh, you know, has to address that to make sure that early career scientists have the opportunity to continue. Um, there's been a freeze on, on hiring. So, you know, postdocs came out of uh, their doctorate programs, you know, they graduated, they got their diploma, and now their next step is to do, you know, the very important step in their career of, of, of obtaining a postdoctoral position. There's been a freeze at universities, and of course, universities are the largest, you know, employer of postdocs. Uh, there's been a hiring freeze, so and and so these four scientists come out of school with a PhD in molecular biology, and they're sitting there waiting for the the gate to open for you know postdocs to be able to report to PI labs and and begin that process. So it's uh, it's a very daunting time, and and, and we're all concerned for young scientists and, and what the future brings. Is there is there anything that organizations like Cure Epilepsy can do to help uh, support and these young researchers and, and help them um, progress in their careers or even start their careers? Yeah, I, I think the, the one thing, you know, is certainly to, to message out that Cure and all the other voluntary groups and funders of research are continuing to amass resources to do that. And we've all gone virtual and things work. We're still working hard to generate the resources to fund research and to get, you know, when research opens to be there to ensure the grants are going to be made and paid. And so I think just the message to the research community that the voluntary sector is is with them and continues to, um, you know, need that talent to, to further drive discovery. Um, I think that's something that, that all organizations could do as a signal to researchers is that we're with you and we're not going away and we're doing our fundraising and we're finding ways to generate dollars to fund research. Heard. <laughs> all the <laughs> listeners hear that too. I'm We've sure. As advocates, <laughs> you know, that, that's what we do as advocates. Um, so I've read that COVID-19 is going to impact research um, moving forward for years to come. For a focus like epilepsy that is already underfunded, that's terrifying to think that, you know, we could be taking steps back when we're already just clawing at the bit to try and get the research produced to make a difference. What does that impact look like for the clinicians and for the patients? Yeah, I, I think it's, it's certainly a little bit unknown, Kelly. Um, you know, there's going to be, when re research restarts, the need for people to, you know, start up what they were doing. But so much of what's on the mind of, of, of curious scientists is what's the next uh, place to go to find an answer. And so I, I think that, you know, A, ensuring, you know, you know, the research community that CURE and other organizations are going to fund this type of research is, is really, really important. I mean, we have to understand that, you know, probably a lot of the epilepsy research that was moving forward got stalled. And it will be restarted. But then there's the other, you know, everybody that comes into the field of epilepsy research comes in with an idea. And, you know, um, if we don't get the young scientists into the labs, we don't get postdocs into the labs, those new ideas won't germinate. And, and that's really a fear. Um, you know, I, I think that epilepsy, like other, other organizations, uh, the, the epilepsy um, population community, you know, has to be, you know, loud and demanding to, you know, get the, the resources that are needed for epilepsy. You do a great job, the, the movement uh, that, that, that um, advocates for epilepsy does a great job at getting the attention, heightening the priority of epilepsy research. And, and, and I think it's going to be even, you know, uh, more important for the community to be visible, to be vocal, to be, you know, demanding um, of policymakers. There'll be a new Congress. And There'll be new people in Congress, and uh, you know there is um, important work to be done for epilepsy advocacy to, you know, um, make it a priority to find the resources to build champions in Congress. And I know con there are champions for epilepsy in Congress, but there'll be a need to develop new friends. And uh, you know, <clears throat> with this administration, if there's a change in administrations, we may see 
you know, uh, you know, more positive uh, uh, outlook for science, if you will. Um, science is uh, is so important. It's evidence. It's science, and and so there's been, you know, a, a disruption in in I think the enthusiasm for science, if you will. We talk about COVID and you know potential treatments or vaccines, and we hear a lot about the FDA and getting these treatments or vaccines pushed through the FDA. Does how does that impact? Um, potential epilepsy treatments. What is going on in the FDA when it comes to all of the other diseases that are are trying to to work with the FDA? And, and that's a great question, Kelly. And and first and foremost, the FDA has has pledged to, you know the importance of transparency and and working with the research community on COVID vaccines and therapeutics. They've also said that the important work that they're doing on the approval process of other drugs in the pipeline and other therapeutics in the pipeline has to continue. But one of the challenges the FDA faces is it's woefully understaffed, and that's a matter of funding, you know, congressional funding for the FDA. Um, you know, many of the, 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 the commissioners have said, you know, quite frankly, the number one challenge at the FDA is workforce development, that there needs to be um, funding that allows the FDA to bring in, you know, uh, you know, additional resources to help marshal the, um, the, the the new therapeutics products, or what have you, through um, through the approval steps. So they've committed to stay focused on moving things forward. But there's always a breaking point when you have you know so so much you know air in the balloon, <laughs> and the balloon can't hold it anymore. And, and then I think it is a real challenge. So again, it gets back to you know, making sure the FDA is properly um, funded by, by Congress, has the resources to, to really get the job done. Um, I, can't, I can't say, you know, that there won't be some slowdown in, in evaluation, but the, the FDA leadership has pledged to, to, to keep doing their mission, and uh, I, I hope that they can. And I hope that uh, we do see, you know, some terrific uh, leadership out of the FDA in terms of what will we'll face all of us in this pandemic, but also, you know, the, um, the need to move new therapeutics through the, through the approval pipeline. Yeah, absolutely. And, um, you know, hearing you loud and clear that I think we all have to be more vocal than perhaps we have been in the past, um, or ever, um, with our elected officials and representatives. We have also heard that the pandemic is disproportionately affecting female researchers. Why? Yeah, I, I think you're right. And I asked my colleagues, I, I said, you know, I, I've heard this too, but tell me, you know, what, 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 what is the issue here? And the issue is really what a lot of um, females in the workplace are seeing is that families are now schooling children at home their caregivers, their educators, and their career um, people. So, unfortunately, the you know the um, the balance is tipped where apparently you know more of the you know pro productivity right now through publishing, if you will, writing papers, writing manuscripts is more on the male side, and it's it's way overshadowed the ability for female scientists to to catch keep up. And, a part, you know, I think part of that is just what, what we're seeing in the workplace, the inequalities in the workplace uh, that, um, you know, that, 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 are that that we're challenged with. And I think that this pandemic has, has brought that to the front. The colleagues that I work with that are home with their children, educating them, making sure Zoom works, making sure they're where they're going, and trying to do Zoom calls with us and do all that we do, I just don't know how they can do it. So in science, it is not immune. It is true. Uh, you know, more of the productivity during this pandemic has been tilted toward the males and the females are, you know, have fallen behind, if you will. And, and that, of course, has some implications for careers. You know, um, like it or not, you know, careers in academia, you know, are based somewhat on productivity and you go through the tenure process based on what you've been able to do and contribute to the body of knowledge and, and certainly science. So, there are some, you know, implications beyond just, you know, how many papers you can get out during the, the pandemic. But, uh, you know, what does this do for my career? Um, you know, to our male colleagues, maybe we just say, you know, pick up some of the slack. <laughs> uh, <laughs> there are the duties. <laughs> I, 
I hope my husband is listening to you say that as I listen to my son on his Zoom call upstairs stomping around in his room. Um, (laughs) So we talked a little bit about um, researchers are starting to return to the labs. What does that actually look like for them? Because I can't imagine that, I mean, there's no return, complete return to normal here. So, you know, what are the new protocols that are in place? How, how are people getting back into the labs at this point? You know, once you've seen one lab, you've seen one lab. And, and once you've been to one university, you've been to one university. They're all very different. They're all driven by, you know, university. If we're in the university setting, the protocols that have been developed there, I know firsthand that there are universities that require, you know, um, significant levels of testing. Uh, not every day, but, you know, a couple times a week if you're going into the lab. <coughs> lab space has been reorganized so that, you know, work work workspaces are further apart. Um, and there can be, you know, obviously there's a demand for uh, PPE for, you know, clinical workers. There, there's also the, to, the possibility there could be a shortage for labs. So labs getting resupplied is very important. But again, getting back to um, to the lab is all dependent on, a number of trickle-down, uh, you know, activities starting from, you know, the state, the local municipality, the university community itself, and then leadership of, of the departments. So I think we're starting to see, as I said, in some areas, you know, um, a portion of the, the, the lab staff coming back. Um, here in the District of Columbia, we're still in a phase two um, um, you know, kind of status. So uh, remote working is still what is expected in the District of Columbia and in Maryland, even at NIH. Uh, you know, the leader, everybody at NIH, except for emergency, you know, employees, you know, deemed to be there for reasons to take care of animal communities and what have you. Uh, you know, we're still all in a remote work um, situation because that's what our governments have asked us to do. But again, it, 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 it will change as this pandemic goes through this curve that it's at, will dictate how much longer, you know, we, we stay in this mode. Is there anything that we can learn from this experience moving forward? I mean, you know, we there's all of these talks about, you know, the winter being incredibly difficult in terms of the pandemic and, and many people perhaps needing to quarantine again. And so how do we prepare for the future? Are there things that um, government, that researchers, that organizations like Cure Epilepsy can be doing now to better prepare for the future? I think that the workforce in the next period of time is probably going to be different. You know, there are, there are you know research um, organizations talking about shifts, working shifts around the clock, so that you know workers are able to get into the labs, use lab equipment, and do it when there aren't a lot of other people there. Well, if you talk to postdocs, they always say they work a very long shift as it is. But that is you know perhaps a, a workplace norm that could change for a period of time. That people will be, uh, you know, able to do some of this work on shifts where there are few fewer people to, to interact with and, and protect themselves. I think also the, the, in terms of governments and, and institutions, whether it be private sector or public sector, making sure that the employees have the safe and secure environment, that all, you know, um, protocols are followed and and, and public health. Uh, um, precautions are taken to give people that confidence they can be in a workplace that's safe, including, the, as we talked about, the, the importance of supplies and equipment, but also the environment they're in. And then in terms of, you know, organizations like Cure and, and other um, organizations that are working closely with the research community, I think it's just important for them to know that you haven't forgotten about them, that you're there, you're fully committed to, to, to funding, you know, innovative, high-impact research to find and drive new new treatments and cures for epilepsy. Uh, that's, that's, that's important for them to hear, that you haven't gone away, that this army of volunteers who, you know, um, do all sorts of activities and now becoming very good at virtual activities are continuing to muster resources to support the research community. It's so important that they hear that that's ongoing. And I think that it'll be very appreciated um, by the researchers, by the scientists, to hear that signal of, you know, they, it's this, this cliche that we always hear, we're in this together. <laughs> but, you know, we are, and, and we're, we're alongside the scientists. And uh, Research America 
you know, was founded more, a little bit more than 30 years ago for the very reason that we're talking about is to put a higher priority on research. And we do advocacy all day, every day, and, and are delighted to, to partner with, uh, you know, patient, the patient community, the academic community, our friends in industry to really be one voice to, to really ask for um, research for health to be among the top priorities in the nation. So we look forward to uh, working alongside you and, and, and as we go through this together. Mike, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you for sharing your incredible expertise, for giving us a crash course in COVID, pandemic, research, government, all of it. And thank you for fighting for all of us as well. It's been a pleasure. Thank you, Mike, for sharing your insights with us today and for your advocacy and efforts to support the research community. For more than 20 years, Cure Epilepsy has understood the value of research to the 3.4 million Americans and 65 million people worldwide who are affected by epilepsy. Now, more than ever, it's vital that we raise our voices and strengthen our efforts in support of epilepsy research. Too many people are impacted by epilepsy. Too many people need new medicines and therapies. And we've made too much progress to be deterred from our goal, a world without epilepsy. To help us support epilepsy research and continue to pursue our goal, please visit cureepilepsy.org forward slash donate. Your support and generosity are greatly appreciated. Thank you. Thank you.